Hello there biology students and welcome to our lesson three video here in our second unit all about ecology where we're going to talk about the biogeochemical cycles. In lesson two we looked at how energy flows through living and non-living factors of an environment. How the sun is the primary source of all energy for this planet but sunlight, solar energy, is a form of inorganic energy. Plants absorb that inorganic energy and through the process of photosynthesis turn it into organic chemical energy that plants and other living organisms can use to fuel their cellular processes and daily functions. There are some other items though that are needed by all living things in order to carry out daily functions and maintain healthy statuses and structure. Okay, uh, The four biogeochemical cycles that we're going to look at are the water cycle, the carbon cycle, the phosphorus cycle, and the nitrogen cycle. All of those entities are extremely important in order to maintain life on this planet. The first cycle that we're going to look at is the water cycle. Something that you should be familiar with and you would have seen to some degree way back in grade school, probably again in middle school, and we're going to see it again right now. There are some basic vocabulary terms that go with the water cycle, such as evaporation, condensation, precipitation, runoff, groundwater, and other types of water reservoirs. Now, the word reservoir, we're going to see quite a bit here throughout this video because the word reservoir is referring to a collection area or a gathering point or a vessel that holds an item. With this cycle, the item is water. So there's several different types of water reservoirs, oceans, rivers, lakes, streams, ponds, groundwater aquifers. Okay? Lots of vocabulary there, but you need to be able to take a look at a diagram to make sure that you're familiar with all of the terms and exactly what those terms are representing. Evaporation is any form of liquid water going from liquid form to water vapor gas form. Okay, so liquids going to gas. That's evaporation. It's the movement of water from liquid form to gas form. Okay, it's one way that water can move through one reservoir to the next. So we're going from an actual ground water reservoir, like a stream, lake, pond, river, ocean, to the water reservoir that's in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is a water reservoir. It's holding water vapor right now. Okay? If that water vapor gets high enough, it loses energy and it cools down. As it starts to cool, it starts to condensate and condensation forms clouds and eventually we get enough condensation to where all those water vapor droplets are joining together and they fall back down the earth in the form of precipitation. That falling back down the earth repopulates a lot of those water surface reservoirs, lakes, ponds, oceans, streams, rivers, etc. Okay? Now, depending on a geologic feature that this rain is falling on, we can have runoff. Runoff again into those water surface reservoirs, like lakes, streams, ponds, creeks, rivers, oceans. And every now and then, that water can also percolate down into the soil. The soil can absorb that water, and that water can run into groundwater reservoirs, like aquifers. Okay? One other thing to note, one other thing to note here about the water cycle is how life, how biotic factors interact, mainly plants. The root system of plants are constantly absorbing water from the ground that's storing that water because plants need water to carry out photosynthesis. Plants also need water to carry out a couple of other processes that take place inside of the plant, like cellular respiration. You need water for cellular respiration too. You're releasing water vapor right now as well. Plants also release water vapor. Not in the same way that we do though. Plant release of water vapor is known as transpiration. Essentially plant sweat. Plants have to get rid of some of the water that they absorb through their roots and they get rid of it through the bottom side of their leaves. They've got these little pores on the bottom side of the leaves known as stoma and that's where water vapor is released. Plant sweat. Transpiration. One other little piece of the water cycle. Now, the carbon cycle has a few more steps 
and a few more processes that you may not be super familiar with. Just like with the water cycle, we have both living and non-living reservoirs. You're a carbon-based life form. I'm a carbon-based life form. Plants are carbon-based life forms. So any type of organism is a reservoir for carbon. You have tons of carbon in you right now. Carbon can also be stored in non-living reservoirs deep underneath Earth's surface as fossil fuels. Carbon can also be stored inside of water. Carbon also can be stored in our atmosphere. So several different reservoirs here with carbon. What we need to know is how it gets from one reservoir to the next. The way that you get carbon into your body is through consumption of energy, organic energy. Okay. You can get it by eating different types of flesh. You can also get a lot of it by consuming plant material. But the way that you get carbon into you is through consumption of organic fuel. Plants get carbon into them during the photosynthetic process. Same little pores on the bottom side of the leaves that are releasing water vapor are also accepting carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is the form of carbon at which it is stored in the atmosphere as. So plants are absorbing carbon dioxide and then fixating that carbon dioxide into energy. Carbon organic energy that you will eventually consume, either directly or indirectly. You are also expelling carbon into the atmosphere and eventually upon death and decomposition, releasing carbon back into the ground. You releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere is a byproduct of cellular respiration which is taking place inside of your cells. We'll get to that here in a couple of units. But you're also releasing carbon dioxide at all times. You're bringing it in to your living reservoir in the form of organic energy and you're releasing it in the form of inorganic carbon dioxide gas. Plants are bringing it in as inorganic carbon dioxide gas and putting it together as carbon organic fuel energy. Plants also release it back down to the soil, another non-living reservoir, the ground, upon death and decomposition. Now, the carbon that is in the ground through death and decomposition over time sinks further and further down, leaches further and further down into the ground, and over thousands and thousands and thousands, even millions of years of storage and heat and compaction, that carbon can be turned into fossil fuels, that fossil fuel mined, harvested by us, and utilized for transportation. The combustion or breaking down of that fossil fuel releases a lot of carbon dioxide gas, an organic form of carbon, into the atmosphere. So then it's stored in that non-living atmospheric reservoir. A lot of what I just got done describing in terms of terrestrial environments, land environments, also happens in water, aqueous environments. Okay? Photosynthesis can happen inside of plants and other small microorganisms that exist in water environments. Cellular respiration, death, and decomposition also happens inside of watery environments and releasing of carbon dioxide gas into the atmosphere also happens in water environments. One of the easier cycles to describe is the phosphorus cycle. Why is it so easy? It's essentially a cycle that exists between living organisms and the ground and living organisms and the ground and living organisms, more living organisms and the ground. Phosphorus is a necessary element for plant growth. Plants absorb phosphorus through their root systems very similar to how they absorb water. They bring in the inorganic form of phosphorus and then manipulate it into a form to where animals can consume it. So you're either directly or indirectly getting phosphorus made available to you, packaged in a way that you can utilize it from plants. Okay, either directly or indirectly from plants. Animals the phosphorus they don't use can expel it back down into the ground, okay? Or upon death and decomposition, the phosphorus is once again released into the ground non-living reservoir. That phosphorus is now in an organic form and made available again for plants to absorb through their root systems 
and utilize in their plant processes and daily functions. The last cycle we're going to look at is the nitrogen cycle. The nitrogen cycle can get pretty complex. There's a few vocabulary terms in there that uh, I necessarily don't want to go into. Okay? What we need to understand about the nitrogen cycle, though, is it actually has to go through plant life in order to be made available to anything else that's living on this planet. But plants can't do it alone. Plants cannot actually take some forms of inorganic nitrogen and utilize them for their daily processes and functions and therefore putting them into a form that other organisms can consume the plant and also get their necessary nitrogen intake. Bacteria and fungi, special forms of bacteria and fungi, assist in breaking down inorganic forms of nitrogen and making them available to plant life for usage. So the nitrogen cycle has some basic um, uh, extra steps that are necessary. All right. A lot of bacteria and specialized fungi that exist on legumes, protein forming plants, okay, all right, green bean like plants, are major, major contributors for taking inorganic forms of nitrogen, reforming them into usable forms of nitrogen for plants, and then organisms like you and I can consume those plants and get our necessary amount of nitrogen for our cellular processes and daily functions. Okay, that does it for this video over the biogeochemical cycles. We talked about bio, life, geo, earth, chemical, phosphorus, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, water. Okay, we talked about how those chemicals cycle through the non-living reservoirs, geo, geology, and living reservoirs, bio, life, on a daily basis. Okay? So the biogeochemical cycles. We're looking at how these chemicals cycle through both non-living and living factors of an environment. The term biogeochemical describes these cycles in themselves. Make sure you feel comfortable with the water cycle, the vocabulary and the processes. Make sure you feel comfortable with the carbon cycle, the vocabulary and the processes. And be sure to be able to tell me why the phosphorus cycle is so easy. And also know what is needed inside of the nitrogen cycle to make sure that we can take inorganic nitrogen and turn it into a form of nitrogen that plants and then animals are able to use. Those are the four major things from this video. You got any questions, by all means, give me a holler. See you guys in class.